so has this been a very hard week for you in the organization? Yeah, it's been a hard week because we've had to make some adjustments to the to our team here in Jacksonville and around the country. And you know, when you have to, you know, adjust your program and right size the organization, we lost some really, really fabulous uh, teammates this week. The good news is we're hiring. We posted a couple a couple dozen job offerings. Uh, yesterday mm -hmm. and we're bringing in some folks and maybe some of the folks that were just let go we can bring back as well. So we know when we spoke with you before we know that when you, you joined the organization in July you got right to work going around visiting with Warriors right. as well as uh, right. your teammates all across the country. What led you to the decision that this was the correct right sizing plan? Well there was a you know obviously with uh, drop in revenues and, and the, the, the desire to focus on what's most important to the to the programs and services our warriors really need. There was a pretty pretty good plan in place when I got here. I'm still mm -hmm. only in my fifth week. Mm -hmm. So what my, my goal was when I first got to the organization was get out and meet our most important partners, that's those we serve, find out what they say, what they feel, look at the surveys from our veterans that we take every year, and then speak to our employees out at the different locations to find out you know, how the services and programs are delivered and then how can we improve, how can we be as efficient and as effective as we can and most importantly, how do we stay as impactful, as beneficial as we can to our warriors, their caregivers, and their families? There's a lot of attention uh, paid to how many offices Wounded Warrior Project had all around the country. I know there was an article in Atlanta, like, hey, they're running an office in Buckhead, you know, mm -hmm. some um, you know, expensive real estate, maybe some of it was donated. But have you made a decision to close any offices around yeah, the country? Uh, yeah, actually, we're, we just, um, with, with the announcements to the workforce this week, we are coming out of nine locations mm -hmm. out of those physical locations. Most of the employees are staying in the area. Mm -hmm. By the way, they're not they're not in their offices most of the time anyway. They're mm -hmm. out doing events with our alumni or at events with the local communities or other nonprofits. Mm -hmm. So we're downsizing our brick and mortar, maintaining footprints where we can, and then really focusing on the delivery of life saving and life changing programs and services to warriors. So we're looking at everything. I mean, we're looking at we're looking at real estate. We're looking at um, service delivery. Uh, where do we need to grow? Where do we need to skinny down? And most importantly, how do we stay most most impactful? What, so out of the 19 plus programs the organization was offering, where did you decide certain programs could? I mean, which program specifically did we dis yeah. did you decide could be so, let go? So the program that we cut this week, we announced a cut with is our uh, Transition Training Academy, which is a valuable program. A lot of veterans took advantage of that program where we teach computer skills and computer coding skills and really skills that transition well into the civilian world. Mm -hmm. But as we looked at those programs, as valuable as they are, there are other organizations that can deliver those programs for transitioning service members. Veterans Affairs has programs that do that. Other nonprofits do that. And that's really what we're looking at. We're not really looking at, I mean, as we had, as difficult it was to cut that program, we're looking at how we can partner with others better with all the other physical health and wellness and engagement programs we deliver to see how we can partner uh, more effectively in the community so we can feed off each other. So be honest with me. Do you feel like the scrutiny of Wounded Warrior Project was fair? Uh, you know, I'm, Lindsay, I'm not focused on that. I'm focused on the future. I, I wasn't mm -hmm. here at the time. Mm -hmm. I do know that what the negative media events have caused us to do mm -hmm. is uh, assess ourselves, mm -hmm. um, see where change is required, and then make those changes. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's what all healthy organizations do. And we're a very healthy organization today because we had the courage to look at ourselves, make necessary changes, and as difficult as it was, you know, make those changes with the warriors foremost in mind, mm -hmm. and most importantly, them and their families in mind. Mm -hmm. And then we'll, we're, now we have a lot of hard work in front of us, so mm -hmm. we're, gonna, we're gonna continue to focus on the need. And by the way, the need is growing. Mm -hmm. 1,500 to 2,000 warriors a month continue to join the ranks of Wounded Warrior Project. Mm -hmm. And this generation of warriors that have served our country Will, will require Wounded Warrior and, and a lot of other nonprofits and government services for many decades to come. So we have to stay committed to what we're doing. And that's why the public feels it's so critical to get this right. I mean, right. your organization does get the lion's share of the donations and the need is great and it's growing. So can you help donors feel confident again in Wounded Warrior Project with this move? Yeah, I hope so. I mean, 
we can't do what we're doing today uh, unless we have the generous support of Americans uh, here in Jacksonville and around the country. So what we've been very clear about doing is staying transparent and open and honest, speaking to the need and, and being effective in how we deliver the programs we deliver to our warriors. Mm -hmm. And I think at the end of the day, if we, if we focus on them and their families and we, we do the very best possible we can in as efficient and as effective a manner as we can, then the rest will come. Um, Americans are smart people. They're very generous, they're very forgiving, and I, I do hope at the end of the day that they continue to give to uh, Wounded Warrior Project and other nonprofits that make a difference. The government cannot do this on their own. Mm -hmm. I spent 36 years in the government. The government cannot do this alone. It requires everybody in the community to make a difference, reach out to our veterans. They are incredibly capable, uh, talented individuals, and especially our wounded population, both visible and invisible, when given the chance, they, they, they triple uh, what you expect they can do. They are incredibly talented individuals. So I, I know in this right-sizing plan, a lot of the resources are gonna go towards long-term mental health is what was That's released. Correct. And and maybe possibly more into the trust, uh, the, the, the Wounded Warrior Project trust to help these veterans in the decades to come. Uh, talk to me about why you felt like that was the right investment for the organization. As part, of our, as part of our assessment in our surveys from our alumni, we know that the, the most important services we provide are those mental health services, whether it's a combat stress recovery program, our independence program where we provide services to warriors in their home where they can continue to heal in a loving environment surrounded by those that, that love them and care for them, um, whether it's um, other, other mental health focused programs like Project Odyssey and uh, the talk program, all those, all those programs are important, so we're staying fully funded, fully invested in those programs focused on the signature wounds of this war, post-traumatic stress and traumatic brain injury. Mm -hmm. So we will stay fully invested in those programs. The areas that, that we've had to find ways to deliver programs smarter are those areas where we engage with warriors, warriors to warriors, mm -hmm. get warriors involved with each other, where they gain strength and resilience from each other, and we're looking at ways to deliver those services and programs in a smarter, cheaper, more impactful manner. So instead of doing high cost, you know, high cost events with a small number of warriors, we're looking to do more, more moderate or lower cost events where we can get warriors and groups sharing experiences with each other. And then that connects them to other programs and services we deliver. So Senator Chuck Grassley had questions uh, for your organization and specifically outlined uh, sporting events and feeling like uh, a lot of the programs are really just sporting events to take the Warriors to. Do you feel like that was a relevant question and is that something y'all have taken seriously? Yeah, in fact, it's something that uh, I had some discussions just a couple weeks ago with Senator Grassley's staff mm -hmm. about the importance of those events. And they question whether we're spending an appropriate amount of resources on those engagement type mm -hmm. activities. Those are the events that encourage our veterans, especially our young veterans, to get out of isolation, get out of their homes, go to events that they enjoy going to, spend time with other veterans, realize they're not alone in how they're feeling or mm -hmm. some of the stresses they're dealing with, and then take advantage of, of other programs. Some of our alumni, in fact, one of our peer leaders, um, Andrew, is a phenomenal individual um, it was an event, it was a football game in Michigan that he went to that brought, got him out of the house. Mm. And the attendance of that football game connected him to other Wounded Warrior Project alumni that got him engaged in other events, peer groups with, with Wounded Warrior Project uh, alumni and uh, got him off of a lot of medications he was taking uh, he lost 150 pounds. He wow. re remarried the woman that he had divorced. He now has children and just gave a kidney to a fellow warrior oh my uh, goodness. that he connected on Facebook with. Uh, and he works for us. And he's a phenomenal role model of what, what happens if you can connect with these fantastic, resilient, talented individuals. So was that football game ticket money well spent? Yeah, I think it was probably pretty good investment. So 
we're looking for ways to do this smarter. We are looking for ways to continue to reach out to veterans, young veterans that have served, create the environments that they'll, they'll, they'll attend, and then you know, get, get them in groups with each other where they can help each other. I mean, it's all about becoming the warrior from the bottom. Mm -hmm. You know, the warrior that's on top being carried to mm -hmm. being the warrior on the bottom that's carrying. And that's Andrew's story, and that's the story of thousands of our alumni that are part of our organization. Mm. And I, I know you met with Senator Grassley. They have a few more outstanding questions they've relayed to me. Uh, they're curious why the independent review uh, was not given to them in like hard document form. Yeah. Is there a hard copy to provide? So I didn't meet with Grass, uh, Senator staff, Grassley. I met, I met with his staff. Uh, the board took the board took the 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 out brief very quickly, and mm -hmm. they took it and have communicated with Senator Grassley's staff. Uh, just last week, and I think they answered all their questions okay. on the independent review. Okay, and then the, uh, another big question by the Senate Judiciary Committee, as well as the donating public, is about the fundraising cost and how yeah. much Wounded Warrior Project mm -hmm. contributes of donations, you know, 20% of all overall donations, if not more, going towards fundraising. Do you stand by that decision making? So I put a lot of thought into it and I've spent a lot of time with our staff. We cannot provide the services and programs we deliver, including these life-saving mental health programs and services to our veterans without the resources to do it. Okay. So raising public awareness, spending dollars to raise the public's awareness that then allow them to generously donate gives us the money the resources to do the programs we do and for every dollar we spend on raising public awareness either on TV or in print print mail or media or whatever we use generates five dollars in return so I was a math major you know if you get ten bucks you can provide ten dollars worth of programs to serve to, to warriors that need it or spend that 10 on advertising and you get 50 you now have 40 mm -hmm. you can spend on programs so magnify that by hundreds of thousands or millions you see why wounded warrior project is the the organization we are today because we have made incredible positive changes in the community by uh, enlisting the public's assistance for the programs that we deliver and that's why uh, spending money on public awareness i think is important but we are looking at ways that we can do it um, you know, cheaper, better, quicker, more efficiently, because at the end of the day, we are focused on the, the warrior and what the warrior needs. So with that kind of return on investment, you stand by that fundraising model at Wounded well, Warrior Project? Well, I, I will tell you, we're looking at it. We're, we're looking at, we're doing an assessment of that right now with the resources we have for next year to figure out the most efficient way of doing it. Yeah, I think that one big question I hear a lot from our viewers in comments are the direct response mailers and <coughs> counting that as a program. Do you feel like that is a legitimate program? Well, it's expense. It's, it's, it's the we're following standard IRS mm -hmm. reporting uh, uh, processes, and mm -hmm. for me, raising public awareness is a is a big piece of what we do and what other nonprofits do. Um, and I think you know soliciting generous Americans' help for these life saving programs is is really important. If we don't do that, then then we don't have the ability to do the things that we do that we know are important because that's the feedback we get from those we serve. Mm -hmm. And I know in a previous um, conversation with you, you were committed to taking a hard look at the executive team at Wounded Warrior Project. And this week, we understand you've reduced it by 50%. Uh, either yeah, almost, almost 50%. Okay, so talk to me about that decision making. Yeah, and that's, that's a really hard decision because mm -hmm. you know the, the organization was built to grow. And I think it was, you know, you know, when it, when, it, when, it, when it doesn't grow, you now have to shrink mm -hmm. a bit. So I figured, you know, and by the way, our executives were on board with this. They were very generous and gracious in saying, take my position. Mm. Uh, you know, I, at the end, you know, when, when you have that kind of commitment from executives, uh, that tells you you got a really fantastic team. Mm -hmm. So I take my hat off to all of them. Um, but we have to start at the top. We lost 15% of our workforce, both locally here in Jacksonville and around the country this week. And now, so now, about now we're people? going to grow back. No, less than 100. I mean, okay. it's, it's you know, a couple dozen less than 100 or mm -hmm. a dozen and a half less than 100. Okay. So there you are. <laughs> um, but still, that's, these are people, so, these no, are the, neighbors. And, any one is, is one too many because, you know, I, I, I notified each of them and, uh, you know, saw them this week. Uh, wish them well, 
and it's, it's a sad day for us to lose any teammates that have dedicated themselves to what they were doing. Mm -hmm. And by the way, it was very tough for them to get their jobs because mm -hmm. they needed to be the right type, type individual. So well, as, I, as we grow back, we hope that many of them will consider coming back and serving in other capacities. Because you were very clear to say these people were not fired. It was a layoff. Uh, and, and, and really, I think a lot of the scrutiny was for the top previous management team. You know, so when you see other neighbors lose their positions, I mean, that's an unintended consequence, I think, for a lot of viewers. You know, you don't ever wish for someone to lose a, a job. So, you know, was it, was it clear to you that you just needed to reallocate the resources, that these people weren't doing a bad job, just maybe not the right job for the organization moving yeah, forward? Yeah, so, so it was very objective criteria for how we arrived at those decisions. Mm -hmm. at the, you know, at, on complete balance, it was start at the top, take as many cuts as you could at the top, look at management, how do we increase the scope of responsibility from management to those that deliver the programs, focus on not impacting the warriors, so protect as much as you can service delivery at the bottom of the pyramid, mm -hmm. and then make those decisions, uh, you know, compassionately and with empathy, and then build back positions that we're building back this week and next week and probably even in months to come in areas that make a difference. So and hopefully we'll bring even more positions back if, if revenues match what we hope they do. So it's possible that some of these folks could be rehired in Gosh, a different I capacity. Hope so. I hope so. Yeah, and I think we advertised a couple dozen position, new positions yesterday focused on uh, mental health, mental health management, other critical skills inside of our organization that have been vacant for some time. Have you been willing to put a dollar amount on how many donations loss like have you put a dollar amount on the loss of donations from this yeah so we're we're almost there for 16 uh, we're coming to the end of the year we've lost about 25% uh, of generous Americans donations mm. and we hope to build that back quickly mm -hmm. uh, next year is going to be a very important year for us so uh, we hope to uh, take care of as many warriors as we can demonstrate the need to the American people mm -hmm. which is why I'm here today mm -hmm. um, you know, let folks know that we're committed, we remain committed, and as the need grows, as evidenced by the 1,500 or 2,000 that continue to join our ranks each month, we'll do the very best we can with the resources we're providing. So when you, let, um, don't mean to jump around, but the executives, I know you say uh, about 50%, were some of them just reassigned to other roles? I mean, it, no. Okay. So, uh, no, they were... Uh, like, oh, as part of the layoff? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. One, uh, I did. I did keep. Um, I did keep one one executive one, who has very special skills and relationships. I think that was Sean Roberts. Yes, yeah, yes, to become a director of Warrior. He, he's Rogers. he's going to work directly for me. Feedback directly from Warriors to me is important. Mm -hmm. John Roberts does it better than anybody, so I moved John out of a senior vice president position and made him a direct report to me, as a Warrior Relations Specialist. So. All of the remaining executives, are they executive vice presidents or are they vice presidents? They're just vice presidents. We, we, corporate world, you go vice president, senior vice president, executive vice president. We removed all the, all the titles of executive vice president and made them vice presidents, which I think are appropriate for the, for the responsibility they have in the organization. And I understand that the COO position will be eliminated in a few other positions. I'm going to, I'm going to try and do both until I drop over and then and uh, I am bringing on a chief of staff position because I do think a chief of staff, I'm a military guy, mm -hmm. I think the need for a chief of staff to balance all the portfolios and keep the trains on track while I'm out visiting warriors I think is an important position. Mm -hmm. So we are building in a chief of staff and, uh, and then we're just going to get after it and that's what we're doing now. And I, I heard, we heard a lot about the uh, the mood in the office that it could some people loved it, so other people felt like it was secretive and um, like a, a, a bully type atmosphere. You know, if you said anything or stepped out of line, you're either fired or you could be sued. Uh, have you had those conversations with folks? I mean, I get the gist that mm -hmm. you coming on board really has felt like a new chapter. You know, I have never felt that since I've been here. Okay. Um, as I've gotten out in five weeks, I've met incredible teammates, warriors. Um, I'm in the middle of reviewing a, a climate survey that I just sent out to all of our employees and I got, that's one great thing about our organization is folks 
are very open about ways to improve, become more efficient, areas mm -hmm. I'd like to see us sustain. Uh, I'm in the middle of reading them now. We're going to do an assessment of those comments directly from our employees, and then we'll make changes in the future mm -hmm. that address those areas that are of concern. So finish the sentence for me. Wounded Warrior Project's future is? It's important, it's relevant, it makes a difference, and it serves warriors. And what do you want warriors to hear from you after this right-sizing plan? Um, I want our warriors to know that we're committed to them and their, and their families. Uh, many, of, many of those in our ranks, like me, are veterans, and, and we want to hear from them. Uh, we want to answer their needs and we, we value their suggestions on how we can improve these programs and services we deliver. Have you had any communications at all with the former CEO, Stephen Narduzzi? Steve and I talked before I took the job and uh, I talked to John Mealy, I, mm -hmm. I talked to everybody and anybody that would take my phone calls because um, obviously I wanted to be as well informed as I could be uh, coming into the job and uh, they all gave me great, great advice about things to think about. I mean, you really campaigned for this position and this is such a big role. Why do you feel like you were called for this? For me, it's a natural extension of my 35 years in uniform and my year as a defense official. Um, you know, my wife and I met at West Point. She's a soldier, my, son's a, was, my wife was a soldier, my son's a soldier. My brother, my sister-in-law, my whole family largely is connected to the military in some way. So for me, um, I, I have seen firsthand, you know, been in combat a few times. I see, I see how quickly uh, our nation's incredibly uh, passionate and, and uh, valuable service members can, can you know, transform themselves when they've been wounded. Mm -hmm. And to be part of an organization that addresses that need, I think is to me very noble and, and, and uh, fits my personality. I've been in touch with some charity watchdog organizations, if you will. Uh, I know you all look at GuideStar, not necessarily Charity Watch, Charity Navigator, but is it important for you to come off of Charity Navigator's watch list? We're working hard to get the highest ratings we can with all the charity organizations that assess us because I know that's how a lot of folks judge which, which organizations they give to. And it's also part of why we're restructuring to reduce costs at every, every way we can. Mm -hmm. um, and, and our team is looking at ways that we can improve our standings with all those organizations. So there's another group uh, called uh, Charity, Char Counting Charity, there you go, Counting Charity. And they've been in touch with me letting me know to look at the long-term support trust and how mm -hmm. much money is being put into the long-term support trust. So I think maybe the public doesn't really understand that like how much excess revenue is left over at the end of a year, tens of millions of dollars moving towards this trust. Do you want to take this opportunity to explain that and the need for it? Well, I, I'll, I'll explain it as best I can with my five weeks under my belt as <laughs> right. CEO. Um, in previous, our commitment to those most grievously wounded in battle mm -hmm. and, and that are recovering in their homes is, is an important commitment and is one of the signature areas that Wounded Warrior Project has made a difference. We have more than 600 individuals with serious wounds that are recovering in their home. Uh, it keeps them out of nursing homes and out of institutions and it lets them heal in ways that they can only do around the loving arms of their family members. Mm -hmm. So that's why we're staying fully invested in the independence program, providing them services in their home with their families where they can recover. The Long-Term Support Trust Program, which is a separate program, provides resources in the event those individuals that are recovering in their homes lose their primary caregiver. Mm -hmm. And over the years, Wounded Warrior Project has put significant amount of money in that fund in the case of a loss of a caregiver. We weren't able to do that this year for obvious reasons, um, but in speaking to individuals and their families that are in that program, I can tell you that gives them great peace of mind to know that if they pass away or are incapacitated or are not able to provide care for their loved ones, that this trust, and it is a trust, is there to pick up the needs to continue that, uh, to continue that care in home. And it gives siblings and other family members peace of mind to know that Wounded Warrior Project is there for them for the rest of their lives.
Abs so for so for me, we're not we're not nearly where we hope to be at this point, mm -hmm. and that's why, uh, if folks want to donate to that trust program, they can earmark their donations to that trust, and it goes straight into that trust, which is a separate 501c3, providing the the long term in here in here in home care for those most seriously wounded. Because I just learned more about it this week in talking with your PR team and explaining that so many of these. Uh, brave men and women are coming home so injured and their parents are taking care of them but obviously the parents can only be around for so long so that is where the trust is going to be able to step in so I think to the donating public that makes sense I talked to I talked to Jason he's in our independence program his parents are Pam and Mike mm -hmm. Jason of course is thriving in, ho in his home surrounded by his parents He's getting many therapies in his home and he's doing very well. Mm -hmm. And he continues to recover and his recovery will take years. Mm -hmm. Pam and Mike told me that long-term support trust not only gives them peace of mind and allows them to sleep at night, but allows their other children to sleep at night because they know, they know that's there for Jason when they pass away. So to me, it was a, it was a brilliant decision uh, we are looking at at, uh, at the at the long-term viability of that program because it is based on generous donations from Americans around the world. Mm -hmm. Well, I have to say I, I, I genuinely appreciate your candor and your honesty and your transparency. I mean, obviously working um, to look at the organization over the last nine months, I mean, it, it feels like a genuine shift. And so I really do appreciate you coming in to talk to us and give us answers. Is there anything we didn't address that you want the public to know? I'd, I'd leave you with um, two thoughts, and it's really the, the, the thought that has kind of been the focus of this, is that the needs of this generation of wounded warriors uh, is great and growing, evidenced by the fact that we're growing by 1,500 alumni a month. Mm -hmm. Secondly, I think Wounded Warrior Project is best poised to take, to be in a position to address those needs, and we will continue to do so. And then the second point is really we, we just hope to uh, be as open and as honest and as transparent and as collaborative with other nonprofits and generous organizations, not just here in the Jacksonville community, but, but around the country, to all come together to um, make a difference in the lives of our young veterans. All right. Thank you so much, Thanks, Mike. Lindsay. I really appreciate no, it. My Sincerely. Pleasure. Thank you. Sincerely. Thanks for having me. Especially in the middle of a storm. Yeah, so. no kidding. <laughs> just a little busy out there.